Section 23 of National Geographic Magazine, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schempf. The Alaskan Boundary Survey, Part 1. Introduction by Dr. T. C. Mendenhall. As an introduction to what Mr. McGrath and Mr. Turner will have to say to you tonight, I have been requested to say something with regard to the origin of the expedition from which they have so recently returned. Everybody present is doubtless familiar with the fact that in 1867 the United States government purchased from Russia that which was then known as Russian America and is now known as Alaska, paying for the same the sum of $7,200,000. There can be no doubt that this was a wise and profitable investment at the time, as it can readily be shown that the territory has returned to the United States in cash more than it cost, and we are just beginning to measure and to understand the real resources which will some time in the future be available. It was perhaps not generally expected at the time, if indeed it was expected at all, that in the purchase of the territory we were also coming into possession of two or three interesting and somewhat provoking controversies. One of these is with regard to the boundary line, which separates Alaska from the possessions of Great Britain in North America. This boundary line was originally defined in a treaty between Great Britain and Russia in the year 1825, and in purchasing Alaska from Russia, we acquired an interest in the boundary line as defined in that treaty. Although it was doubtless thought at first that the boundary line was well and satisfactorily defined, it has since come to be generally recognized that the definition is very unsatisfactory by reason of the fact that it was based upon the very meager information available at the time the treaty was made i may remind you briefly that the treaty defines the line as beginning at the southernmost extremity of prince of wales island which point was supposed to lie on the parallel fifty four degrees forty minutes north latitude Thence it shall ascend along the Portland Canal until the 50th parallel of north latitude is reached. From this point, in accordance with the treaty, it shall follow the line marked by the summits of the range of mountains parallel to the coast, until such line meets with the 141st degree of longitude west of Greenwich. From this point, it shall proceed along the 141st meridian west of Greenwich until the Arctic Ocean or the frozen ocean which is the term used in the treaty is reached in a supplementary paragraph it was agreed that all of the islands known as the island of the prince of wales should belong to russia and hence in virtue of our purchase to the united states and also that whenever the summit of the range of mountains referred to before shall be at a greater distance from the coast than ten marine leagues the limit of the possessions of Russia shall be formed by a line parallel to the windings of the coast, and never more than ten marine leagues from the shore. It will thus be seen that the boundary line is divided into two parts, which differ materially from each other. One of these is that line which proceeds from a point near Mount St. Elias, that is to say, the 141st meridian of longitude west from Greenwich and runs directly north to the frozen ocean. This, being an astronomical line, can readily be located by astronomical methods, and should give rise to no controversy. That part of the line, however, which separates what is known as southeastern Alaska from the British possessions, is by no means simple and easily determined. At the time the treaty was made between Russia and Great Britain, the best information available was that contained in Vancouver's map which was and in some respects is still the best available representation of bering sea in that part of north america it seems tolerably certain however at the present time that the range of mountains which was assumed to run parallel to the coast has no real existence and that it is therefore necessary to fall back upon the second definition of the boundary line that is the line which is to run parallel to the windings of the shore and be nowhere more than ten marine leagues from the same. Experience has shown that the longer a question concerning the location of the boundary between two great nations is left unsettled, 
the more difficult it becomes to decide it in a matter satisfactory to both in a region which is sparsely settled and where there are and can be few interests either public or private that conflict in any way it is not difficult to determine a boundary line without dispute the postponement of the question however may leave it undetermined until the population is greatly increased property becomes more valuable and mineral or other resources have been discovered which make it important to each contending side that every foot of territory shall be contested for a very few years after the alaska purchase in 1872 general grant then president of the united states recognizing the difficulties attending the settlement of this question and especially the difficulties which might arise from its further postponement recommended in his annual message to congress the appointment of a commission for settling the boundary line between alaska and the possessions of great britain the country being practically unsurveyed it became necessary to consider a method for a suitable survey of the country adjacent to the boundary line in order that it might be correctly defined and various estimates of the cost of such an operation and the length of time required for its execution were made at that time the matter was then allowed to drop however and nothing further was done until nearly fifteen years later when president cleveland again brought the subject forward by referring to it in his message to congress in the estimates submitted for the year eighteen eighty eight an item of one hundred thousand dollars was inserted by the department of state for a preliminary survey of this boundary no action was taken upon this item however but in the following year an appropriation of twenty thousand dollars was made the survey to be conducted by the united states coast and geodetic survey in accordance with plans or projects approved by the secretary of state in drawing up the plan for the work it was agreed to begin the operations by the establishment of points upon the one hundred and forty first meridian west of greenwich in order to accomplish this it was necessary to send observers into the interior and for this purpose in the spring of eighteen eighty nine two parties were organized to ascend the yukon river and its branch the porcupine in order to establish camps as near as possible to the one hundred and forty first meridian for the purpose of making the necessary astronomical observations for the determination of its location they were also instructed to execute such triangulation and topography as would be necessary for the identification of the locations of the observing camps and to establish permanent monuments as nearly as may be upon the meridian line these two parties one to occupy a camp on the yukon river as nearly as possible where it is intersected by the one hundred and forty first meridian and the other on the porcupine were directed respectively by mr mcgrath and mr turner whose observations are summarized in the following papers it was estimated that one year would be sufficient for the accomplishment of the work and this estimate was a liberal one provided ordinary weather conditions had prevailed in that part of the country it was found however that these conditions were extremely unfavorable especially for astronomical work on account of the continued cloudiness rendering observations for a long time absolutely impossible the extreme low temperature also rendered work difficult and this of itself would have stood in the way of an early completion of the task had it been possible to carry on the astronomical observations it thus happened that notwithstanding the rigor of the climate and difficulty if not impossibility of obtaining supplies from outside sources these parties were obliged to remain in the interior of alaska during two years notwithstanding the unfavorable conditions under which they existed during this time every individual of both parties returned in good health and in good condition indeed there was scarcely a case of even ordinary illness during the entire campaign a fact which must reflect great credit upon those charged with the management of the parties so far as we have been able to ascertain by recollections and comparisons made up to this date the work with which messrs mcgrath and turner were charged has been done in a manner entirely satisfactory and so as to reflect great credit upon these gentlemen i am sure they have very much to tell you which is of interest in relation to their experiences in this almost unknown and unexplored region and i will not longer stand in the way of their doing so end of section twenty three
Section 24 of the National Geographic Magazine, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schempf. The Alaskan Boundary Survey, Part 2. The Boundary South of Fort Yukon, by J. E. McGrath. The address of Dr. Mendenhall, having satisfactorily described the duties which called our party into the interior of Alaska, I shall confine myself to a plain statement of the most prominent points of interest, connected with the people and country that came under my observation during a two-year stay in our great northwestern possession. It may not be amiss to call attention to a few salient facts about this vast territory whose remoteness from the rest of the country has caused but little attention to be paid to its possibilities and character by the people at large until the rights of certain of its old-time inhabitants to a peaceful occupation of some favorite summer resorts of theirs on a few small islands off its coast have been rudely interfered with alaska has an area of nearly five hundred and eighty thousand square miles its shoreline exceeds in length the combined lengths of the Atlantic, Pacific, and Gulf Coasts, belonging to the United States, by 7,239 miles. The ocean that freezes along its northern coast is the resort of the greatest whaling fleet in the world. Its islands of St. Paul and St. George are the breeding places of the fur seal, for hunting which a company pay the United States government a royalty which equals, when the maximum catch is allowed, about ten per cent on the cost of the whole of alaska in the archipelago which extends about the national domain and nearly eight degrees of longitude into the eastern hemisphere are the haunts of one of the most highly prized of all fur-bearing animals the sea otter on the banks off the alaska peninsula the fish commission steamer albatross has found those very valuable food fishes the cod and halibut in such numbers as to make these seas compare favorably with the rich fishing banks of newfoundland along the southeastern coast a large mining population is profitably employed and at the great treadwell mine on douglas island near juneau the largest stamp mill in the world is engaged in crushing alaskan ores along every favorable bay and stream on the southern coast salmon canneries are to be found and the importance of this industry may be appreciated when it is considered that the season's pack for eighteen eighty nine amounted to seven hundred three thousand cases in the interior gold copper and coal have been found but as yet the most valuable exports are the many rich furs for which alaska has long been noted no feature of alaska is more remarkable and noteworthy geographically than its great river the yukon this mighty stream, rising within 20 miles of the Pacific Ocean, estimated from the head of Lynn Canal, flows for about a thousand miles northwesterly, passing inside the Arctic Circle near Fort Yukon, and then bending its course south-southwestward, flows on for another thousand miles until it reaches Bering Sea. The Russians, during their domination in Alaska, did but little in the way of exploring the interior and it remained for the hardy pioneers of the western union telegraph expedition who were occupied during eighteen sixty six and eighteen sixty seven in selecting a route for the telegraph line to connect europe and america by way of siberia established the identity of the river known to the british as the Luz and to the russians as the quick pack or yukon in the early days the trade of the river was divided between the two peoples just mentioned the Hudson Bay Company had established a post at Fort Yukon, and the servants of this company received their goods by dog trains from the Mackenzie River District, extending their operations as far down the river as Nuklukayet, near the mouth of the Tanana River, and so securing the trade which at the present day is considered the best in the Yukon District. The Russians had to bring their supplies up the Yukon in sailing vessels and with this slow means of transportation found nulato far enough in the interior for their trading post the english occupation of the site of fort yukon continued until eighteen sixty nine in that year captain raymond of the united states engineers was sent up the river to determine the location of the post a total eclipse of the sun afforded him an admirable opportunity to determine his longitude this being supplemented by observations of the moon and moon culminating stars a latitude was observed 
and then as it was placed beyond doubt that the station was in the united states territory the hudson bay company retired up porcupine river to a point that the factor mr mcdougall thought was well within the british possessions captain raymond also mapped the river between fort yukon and its mouth and when lieutenant schwatka made his famous raft journey down the river from its head in eighteen eighty three he supplemented raymond's work and for the first time a fair idea of the course of the yukon river was given to the world captain everett smith of the western union telegraph expedition made a reconnaissance of the delta and the present maps nearly all use the chart made by him of the mouth of the river the great reward for the pioneers in the salmon canning trade on this river has made the agents of the alaska commercial company at st michael very anxious to discover a channel in the river up which ocean-going vessels might be taken at present all stores intended for the yukon river valley must be taken to st michael and there transferred to small light draft river steamboats which then have a risky outside sea voyage of eighty miles before they can find safety in the most northerly of the outlets of the river which is the afoon mouth its great volume of water is poured out through so many different channels that in no one can a sufficient depth be found to allow the admittance into the river of sea-going vessels tempted by the prize which is in store for the first ones to establish salmon canneries on the river the alaska company's agents have spent much time in searching for a deep water channel in this quest they can secure no help from the natives who appreciate what the consequences will be for themselves if the white man can bring his ships in and hitherto the search has been a failure the inhabitants of the lower yukon were the most miserable foul and degraded beings that we saw in alaska of personal cleanliness they seem to have no conception and it was distressing to note the terrible diseases under which some of them seemed to be wasting away the chief reason for their dreadful personal condition is their partiality for seal oil under all conditions and circumstances they seem to steep themselves in it it never has an odor which would make it acceptable to civilized people and coat after coat of this stuff laid on from childhood to old age results in making the person so treated a very unwelcome object for notice for either nose or eye of the white man the lower part of the delta is regularly submerged each spring and often the miserable dwellers therein have to seek refuge in their boats but just so soon as the waters subside the people return to their damp and sodden hovels which really never dry out entirely on account of the excessive rain that characterizes the lower river this condition of person and dwelling together with an almost exclusive fish diet for one half the year results in some terrible forms of diseases among the maklemuts and at various points we saw poor miserable creatures whose condition was more hideous than anything i ever read of the worst effects of plague or leprosy in the spring summer and fall this section is the home for innumerable geese swans and ducks the maklemut then lives well and we were told wonderful stories of the number of birds killed by single hunters in a day's hunting two wild geese could be bought in some places for a head of tobacco and a miner told us that the ruling rate for wild goose eggs at the trader's store near cape romanoff was a head of tobacco or one-third of a pound of lead for one hundred fifty eggs it is needless to say that the native inhabitants of this section are not very particular about the quality or condition of the food they eat there are no fastidious scruples about the cause of death of their game a white whale or seal that drifts ashore is taken with thanks and if it is evident that the creature has been dead for some time there is the compensating advantage that the flesh is more tender the yukon river does not lack for settlements but their size and condition hardly satisfied the ideas we had formed of them before they greeted our view kotlik is the home for a single white man the old russian trader and his family andreyevsky is only a name a portion of the old storehouse here came in very handy for wood supplies when we passed it going up river a kogomut has some importance because it is the home of the russian priest who has spiritual charge of most of the natives of the lower river kozoreski is a few miles above the large catholic mission of the holy cross white anvik affords a home to the bishop-elect of the episcopal diocese of interior alaska 
Next above Anvik is Nulato, once the outpost of the Russian Trading Company, and noted for being the scene, so graphically described by Professor Dahl in his work on Alaska, of the only massacre perpetrated by the Indians on white people in the Yukon Valley. The next station of note, after passing Nulato, is Nuklukayet, the emporium for the trade of Tanana River and the most productive trading post on the Yukon. About 100 miles above Nuklukayet, the Yukon begins to spread out into the great lake-like section where it is locally known as the Flats. In this portion of its course, the stream is dotted with myriads of islands. The great width of the river, and the constant changes in the shallow channels leading to every point of the compass, make this the most dreaded part of the river for the steamboat men. Near Fort Yukon, the river is said to be seven miles wide. Probably no point on the Yukon is better known by name to people who have not visited the interior of Alaska than Fort Yukon. Here once was the largest and best equipped trading station on the river. It was the most westerly of the Hudson Bay Company posts, and until Captain Raymond determined that the site was within the territory of the United States, it controlled all the trade of the upper river. Now a broken chimney, several mounds of ashes, and a few graves are all the evidences that remain to show where the great station once was. Above Fort Yukon, the names of a number of places appear on our maps, but in reality only two locations are permanently occupied on the whole upper half of the river. These are at the mouth of Forty Mile Creek and at the site of Old Fort Selkirk. The scenery along the Yukon River will compare favorably with any views I have ever beheld myself or seen reproductions of from any river in our country. Our summer trip up the stream was one continued succession of pleasant surprises. The hills were heavily wooded with spruce, birch, and aspen. On shore we found flowers on every side, while birds and insects were as plentiful as we ever saw them in the northern states. At Fort Yukon, which is a little over a mile inside the Arctic Circle, the heat was almost insufferable both in august and july and the only warning given us of what we might expect a little later on was afforded at nulato where we saw a well being sunk that had already been driven through twenty-five feet of frozen ground in spite of our pleasant summer as we were all ignorant of what might be the rigors of an arctic winter there was much anxiety about what the future would have in store for us all the traders at St. Michael were certain that the coming winter would be a severe one, because the one just passed had been very mild. Rain had fallen on Forty Mile Creek on January 1st, 1889, and according to all the laws of Alaskan weather, the approaching winter would have to make up for the mildness of the preceding one. Mr. McGuestin told us of the winter of 1886, when the signal service thermometer at his station recorded minus 70 degrees, and his face was frozen while going about 50 feet from his house to call some miners who lived in a cabin nearby to see how low the temperature was. Mr. Mayo was certain that a later winter was still colder, but unfortunately he had no spirit thermometer that year, and so he had to judge entirely by his sensations. With all this expert testimony, we began to anticipate trouble. A careful estimate was made of what wood we would need for our three fires, and it was with much foreboding of its inadequacy that we saw the winter start in while we only had enough wood on hand to last, as it afterwards turned out, for two years, and then have enough left over to give the steamboat Arctic four or five cords when we abandoned the camp in 1891. During the first winter, the temperature fell to minus 59 degrees, while the second season gave us a still lower minimum, or minus 60.5 degrees. We had a long spell in January and February, 1890, when the temperature did not get above 82 below the freezing point, minus 50. But at no time did this cause any suffering. Our systems became gradually inured to the cold, and without any such amount of extra clothing as would excite comment in the middle straits in the winter, we were able to go about attending to our regular duties, and taking the indoor exercise that was necessary for our keeping in good health. Fur garments were worn only when members of the party went on journeys, and then they were taken for use at night, as we used no tents in any of our trips. In the quarters, fires were not kept up beyond our time for retiring, except when observations kept us up all night. 
but in spite of this water never froze in the room the men occupied and in the roof of the officer's room an opening eighteen inches square was kept open summer and winter for ventilating purposes i suppose our capacity for assimilating fats was very much increased from a little discovery i made last march one day while looking over the report of the provisions used by the party i noticed an extraordinarily large amount of lard charged as it showed that the man who was acting as cook was using monthly twice as much of this article as his predecessor in office who was allowed to return home in the previous august had used in six months i called on him for an explanation he claimed that he was using it in a regular and proper way and when asked for what purposes it went he said that for one thing he always put a pound of it in the soup every day no one had developed any attack of dyspepsia during the season and i suppose we must thank our climatic surroundings for being saved from the natural consequences of this practice during the intense cold the mercury froze of course on forty mile creek one experimenter made bullets of this metal which he fitted into cartridges and fired from his rifle we amused ourselves with making mercury discs which we would break to see the fracture coal oil and california brandy were also experimented with and solidified in a very short time the principal sources of worry and suffering at an arctic station are to be found in the short dark days of winter and the long bright days of summer our first winter was made rather worse than usual because of the small amount of oil we had to carry us through for twenty hours each day during the months of december and january no reading or writing could be done in quarters without the aid of artificial light and as we only had enough oil on hand to allow us to keep a lamp going for four hours per day we had many a dark hour to endure and those two months appeared almost endless the long day of the summer seemed to affect some people even more than the long night of winter they appeared to become nervous and on the whaling fleet it is not unusual for men to become insane and some are driven to suicide at camp davidson we were not inside the arctic circle but nevertheless no stars were visible to the naked eye from about april twenty fifth to august fifteenth and in june at midnight diamond print could be read by natural light out of doors some members of the party suffered severely from insomnia during the summer and it did not seem to help them in any way when the heaviest cloths were used to curtain their cots although fourteen hundred miles in the interior and certain of mail only once a year we could not complain of loneliness while the indians were near us and very few indeed were the days that some of these social people omitted calling and breakfasting dining or supping with us taken as a whole the indians in our vicinity were clean honest gentle and virtuous never have they occasioned the white men who came among them any trouble and hitherto the mutual relations of the two races have been of the most cordial and pleasant character the miners early recognized the necessity of seeing that none of their numbers should do the indians injustice and rigid laws have been adopted to enforce due consideration of indian rights whatever work an indian does for a miner or whatever he sells one is paid for generally at a high price indians working in the mining claims receive three to four dollars per day which is relatively higher than the eight dollars paid to white men what the outcome of the alaska placer mines will be is beyond any one's power to estimate now the miners have prospected on nearly every stream in the country even the arctic portions of the territory have not proven inaccessible to those solitary searchers for the precious metal and everywhere they have found color but up to the present time no place has paid steadily and well except the small river called by the natives chitandepe and by the whites forty mile creek here last season there were about one hundred fifty white men and when we left camp davidson in june eighteen ninety one it was the only river below pelly except the koyukuk on which mines were worked the lower part of the forty mile is abandoned now but the richest ground is in the gulches near the head of the creek and it is estimated that it will be several years before the treasures are all extracted mayo and mcgueston are the traders who supply these men with stores and they told me that their shipments of gold dust for the past year amounted to forty thousand dollars and this they estimated was a little less than one half of the total output of the creek the regular mining season lasts for only about three months 
but some men do a little winter mining which is extremely laborious it necessitates first chopping a great quantity of cord wood which then has to be hauled to the bar that is being worked here it is heaped up in piles and fired and then the thawed ground is dug out and piled on some bank above high water and when the summer comes and the ice goes it is taken down and washed out in the winter of 1889-1890, three men took out 23,000 buckets of dirt, which netted them $1,000 apiece for their three months of the hardest kind of mining work known. The largest nuggets ever found in Alaska have been found on Forty Mile Creek. One was shown us which was worth $56, and in last July, a man named Nelson took out a nugget worth $260 the evidences that alaska gives on all sides of the existence of gold will always tempt men to go there but real exhaustive examinations of her streams will not be made until the miners feel sure that when they return to their trading posts after a long season's prospecting they can depend on finding food there as affairs are managed now they must return to the stations in the middle of their short working season to see what the steamboat has brought and no one can tell when some accident will happen to the one steamer that connects the interior with St. Michael, and force all hands to leave the country, or else face the possibility of starvation, as was the case in the fall of 1889. It is a very risky venture trying to live on the country in the interior of Alaska. End of section 24《セクション25of the National Geographic Magazine, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schempf. The Alaska Boundary Survey, Part 3. The Boundary North of Fort Yukon, by J. Henry Turner there is perhaps no portion of the vast territory of alaska so little known as the country stretching northward from fort yukon to the arctic ocean eastward to the international boundary and westward to the headwaters of the kayakuk river simpson and franklin skirted its northern shore allen penetrated into it a short distance and stoney proved the existence of a mountain range trending to the eastward notwithstanding the fact that the summits of lofty mountains are visible in the horizon to the north of fort yukon the impression has long prevailed that the river plains extend to the shores of the frozen ocean this idea has even been advanced by an explorer of note within the last few years travelers have sedulously avoided this region for the obvious reason that the supposed absence of navigable rivers and remoteness of trading posts and other means of communication with the outer world would render it peculiarly unsuited for summer exploration it is believed that certain discoveries made during a journey northward from camp colonna in the spring of eighteen ninety will throw considerable light on the geography of this terra incognita i shall take occasion to revert to this question in closing my remarks Mr. McGrath has already described the river from its mouth to Old Fort Yukon, at which point the two parties separated. On August 3rd, the steamer Yukon, with the Porcupine River Party and its supplies aboard, left Fort Yukon and three days thereafter reached Camp Titman, the then head of navigation, distant 158 miles from the mouth of the river. The time of arrival was unavoidably ill-chosen, as the July droughts had reduced the stream to its lowest summer ebb. Observations placed Camp Titman 39 miles west of the boundary. Captain Peterson refused to tarry, since the river was still falling, as plainly indicated by wet lines along the banks and mudflats, and the danger of being stranded on a sandbar until the following spring was too great a possibility to be overlooked. Supplies were consequently unloaded with all the expedition possible, and the steamer returned to Fort Yukon. Had our time of arrival been delayed a week, no difficulty whatever would have been experienced in landing the party at the boundary, as the river rose rapidly in a few days. A whaleboat brought from San Francisco and a large unwieldy lighter borrowed from the Alaska Commercial Company were the sole means of transportation at our command. 
lack of time forbids me to enter into a detailed account of the many difficulties and vexatious delays encountered in conveying twenty-five tons of supplies piecemeal sixty miles upstream in the face of a strong current broken into rapids in many places and around banks undermined by the action of the water and fringed with fallen trees many mishaps occurred despite all precautions and serious casualties were often avoided by a mere hair's breadth on one occasion the entire party including several indians narrowly escaped drowning by being drawn into the swirling waters harkert a member of the party had the misfortune to lose the end of one finger while handling a heavy box and polt another of the men had an ankle broken while assisting the men in tracking the heavy lighter upstream the indians unfitted by disposition or previous training for such arduous work proved unreliable it was unfortunate too that early in the season an indian while attempting to convey a heavy tow-line across stream in his frail canoe was capsized and drowned the accident led to open hostility on the part of the natives and but for the timely intervention of the hudson bay company's post trader mr firth the consequences might have proved serious several plans to murder the entire party were discussed among the hot-headed younger indians but the wiser counsels of older heads prevailed and as our acquaintance with the natives progressed their mistrust and hostility gave place to friendliness preliminary observations made at rampart house demonstrated the necessity of a further march of thirty-three miles upstream before the boundary would be reached a well-sheltered spot was finally selected in a timbered valley at the mouth of shunagan river and preparations were at once begun to build a comfortable log house for winter quarters the work was often interrupted by snowstorms of frequent occurrence beginning in august ice began to form along the river banks in early september and by the end of october a snowy mantle covered the country and all the streams were fast locked in ice the log cabin and all observatories were ready for occupation by october one the days rapidly shortened as the season progressed and on november sixteen the sun in its course southward disappeared beneath the horizon during the shortest days lamps were extinguished at eleven a m and lighted at one p m by two p m observations upon the stars were perfectly practicable this state of affairs prevailed until january twenty six on which date the sun reappeared as the first few feeble rays of the luminary struggled through the frost-laden windows the spirits of the men brightened and rushing forth from the cabin they capered about like madmen in an excess of joy many indians visited our camp during the winter months the best season for travel in this region of soft snow the kind of sled used on the coast is unsuitable and is replaced by a toboggan seven feet long and two feet wide with a large roll in front to fend off the snow the dogs usually four in number are hitched tandem and so close together as to necessitate cutting off their tails no sled dog in the porcupine river country possesses this ornamental appendage for it is amputated early in youth among the coast tribes all the dogs possess large bushy tails which serve the admirable purpose of keeping their noses warm in the cold winter nights no sled trips with the single exception of one to rampart house late in december were made at this time there was no particular necessity for them and no member of the party possessed sufficient enthusiasm to undertake a journey for the pleasure to be derived from it as stated before scarcely a day passed that some indian did not make camp colonna his abiding place until kicked out we found the natives inveterate beggars there was some excuse for this as early in january the stock of provisions at rampart house became exhausted the natives with characteristic improvidence had neglected in the summer to lay up food for the winter and the new year found starvation staring them in the face several hunting parties had gone out to return empty-handed and to report that the deer had migrated southward many indians were reduced to the necessity of subsisting upon moose-skin bags deerskin thongs and old sled covers several old people died of sheer starvation and the outlook grew gloomy timely assistance from the missionary mr wallace and a case of flour from camp colonna tided over the emergency until a few deer were secured by an expert hunter who had been permitted to use a winchester rifle from our camp 
the main food supply of the porcupine river indians consists of fish and reindeer meat in early spring this fare is supplemented by a vegetable diet of wild rhubarb and a root resembling licorice later in the season blueberries raspberries and wild currants are found in abundance salt is never used although we were supplied with an abundance of this article and offered it to the native gratis none seemed to desire this addition to their cooked meat scurvy is unknown in this portion of alaska and the remoteness of the settlements from the civilizing influence of the whites has prevented the introduction of several fatal diseases but scarlet fever nearly depopulated the country many years ago the prevailing distemper now seems to be of a pulmonary nature many natives seemingly in perfect health were suddenly attacked and in a few weeks succumbed to acute pneumonia or galloping consumption medicine is of no avail the doctor who accompanied the expedition administered gallons of physic but if not present to watch the patient the course of treatment was at once discontinued unless beneficial results followed the first dose as several indians treated by the doctor died his influence over them rapidly waned from implicit confidence the natives suddenly reverted to extreme distrust and resumed the rites for curing the sick practiced by their own shamans very little attention is shown the sick we detected the post trader's hunter in the act of devouring some crackers supplied him for his daughter who was sick abed the girl subsequently died doubtless of starvation abandoned to her fate by her unnatural father shortly afterward a young woman in the settlement was taken sick and permitted to slowly starve to death by a sister who subsequently attempted the destruction of her surviving child by tying it to a stake out of doors and leaving it to freeze in the winter night though the indian may evince affection for his children it extends to no other member of the family father and mother brother and sister wife and husband are neglected as soon as sickness overtakes them often abandoned and not seldom expedited into the other world by means of a club in order to save further trouble no instance of infanticide came under my notice during our stay on porcupine river although very common among coast tribes of bering sea and especially at st michael cannibalism is by no means rare a shocking instance of this was reported to us during our stay at rampart house two women running short of provisions killed a man and a boy while asleep and subsisted upon the remains for several weeks though grasping unscrupulous and often dishonest in his dealings with the whites in his own tent the indian is a creature of another stamp his ideas of hospitality are strangely inconsistent with his conduct in other matters the last morsel of food is shared cheerfully with the hungry stranger the warmest place before the fire is assigned for his use and the snuggest corner of the tent is reserved for his sleeping hours in the matter of cleanliness and morality the native is like unto his ancestors no exhortation by the most eloquent missionary can force him to bathe he fears the water like a cat no amount of scriptural teaching can convey to his brain the first glimmering of the meaning of such a word as morality and unless he is permitted to carry with him at all times a plentiful stock of certain insects he considers his usefulness at an end it is somewhat singular that a race of beings so degraded and having so little need of a full language should be credited with a vocabulary of twenty thousand words mr wallace the present church of england missionary at rampart house doubtless carried away by enthusiasm assured me that in every respect the native language was far superior to the english tongue while this statement should be taken cum grano solace it is undoubtedly true that the language in question is superior to most of the native tongues in northern alaska commencing at sanati's village the language remains unchanged until peel river is reached it is much to be regretted that the archdeacon macdonald has provided no vocabulary or grammar to accompany his translations of the new testament into the native tongue the various tribes speaking this language are divided into the kuchna kuchin sedatus tribe the nazi kuchin dwellers in the north numbering one hundred fifty or thereabouts residing in the country north of fort yukon and known also as the gen de large the vunta kuchin or lake indians inhabiting the region of the lakes northeast of rampart house the nun kuchin or river indians 
the Trangic Cuchin or Black River Indians residing on the river of the same name, and the Tukta tribes living in the vicinity of La Pierre's house. Excepting the Tukta tribes, the other natives enumerated, numbering perhaps five hundred, trade at Rampart House. In former times, this post was a source of great profit to the Hudson Bay Company, as many black fox skins were brought in by the Natse Kuchin during our ten months residence but two skins of this kind were secured and the yearly total of other furs was correspondingly diminished the greatest bulk of furs is now obtained from the black river country and consists chiefly of black bear and beaver skins eskimos from the northern coast sometimes visit rampart house in order to exchange walrus lines for wolverine skins which are afterwards traded to passing whalers for whiskey or old-fashioned breech-loading winchesters early in march it was decided to take a journey northward along the boundary to the shores of the arctic ocean a request was therefore sent to mr firth at rampart house to provide dried meat for the trip and engage the services of two reliable natives with sleds and a runner to go ahead this was accordingly done seven men and four sleds of four dogs each left camp on march twenty seventh bound for the arctic ocean two of the indians edward and moses by name had travelled over the proposed route before while engaged in trading with the inuit of the northern coast so no concern was felt on this score the temperature had risen gradually during the previous day and bright skies and sleeping winds indicated that the time was ripe for making the start in addition to the dried meat, pemmican and a supply of canned meats, with a modicum of alcohol stowed away in the event of snake bite, completed the stock of provisions. My sled was loaded with a camera outfit and various instruments for the determination of geographical positions, heights, etc. It was noon when the final preparations were completed and the party started. Bergman, Foreman, and Engelstadt accompanied the party. On the first day, six miles were made and the party camped for the night in a grove of spruce with dry standing wood conveniently near the mode of camping as practiced by the indians and hunters along the river is as follows a well sheltered spot is selected in a clump of spruce with abundance of dry wood in the immediate vicinity after unhitching the dogs which is the first proceeding the snowshoes are removed and used as shovels to clear away a space twenty feet square and from two and a half to five feet in depth an abundance of green boughs are then scattered evenly over the floor the sides braced by brush and a backrest is secured by laying several sticks lengthwise to a height sufficient to serve as a windbreak a quantity of dry timber is then heaped up on the opposite side and fired skins are spread over the spruce brush on the floor parkas blankets harness etc are hung over the sides and the camp is finished the dogs are fed first after the meat carried for the purpose has been thawed out before the fire during the interval the men in our case at least stayed the pangs of hunger by pieces of pemmican succulent as chips followed by the inevitable pipe a pot full of dried meat is then boiled and a large kettle of strong tea brewed pilot bread or flapjacks if procurable complete the bill of fare we had provisions for twelve days but expected to be away for eighteen so it behooved us to watch the larder with a jealous eye early in the morning next day the party followed the windings of the shunagan river and ascended the long slope leading to boundary rock so named from its proximity to the international boundary it was decided to ascend the rock which projects about one hundred feet above the general surface from this elevated point twenty seven hundred feet above the sea and nineteen hundred feet above camp colonna an excellent view was obtained of the surrounding country to the eastward the windings of the porcupine could be traced for miles to the westward a short but bold range of mountains seemingly volcanic cut off the view a bank of fog overhung the river and masses of vapor filled the valleys in various directions there was scarcely enough wind blowing to lift a feather and all looked forward in happy anticipation to a swift and easy journey it was determined to camp for the night in a small valley some few miles to the northward and all haste was made to rejoin the sleds which were on the full gallop and liable to outdistance us a few minutes after overtaking the sleds a sudden roaring assailed our ears 
a fog bank to the eastward burst asunder and from its recesses issued forth a wind that nearly swept us from our feet clouds of glittering snow filled the air and beat upon us with all the fury of a hailstorm it was only by the most strenuous exertions that we were enabled to reach the sleds which had taken shelter under the lee of a small hill in that brief time the end of my nose one temple and the tip of the right ear were frozen solid and a broad white streak fully an inch wide extending from eye to chin bore evidence of the rapidity with which a man may freeze if the conditions be favorable all expedition possible was necessary to gain the shelter of the friendly trees for the remainder of that day that night and until noon of the following day the shrieking north wind swept over the trackless waste in all the fury of a dakota blizzard traveling was quite out of the question men and dogs huddled together in a promiscuous heap striving to secure protection from the biting blast the next morning everything had changed the sun shone out bright again and the wind had died away during the forenoon we climbed continually up the further side of the valley and about twelve o'clock reached the summit of a pass at an altitude of twenty five hundred feet spread out before us and extending eastward to the furthest horizon appeared a plain covered with a dense growth of spruce birch and cottonwood a veritable oasis in the midst of utter desolation its western limit was a plateau doubtless the northern continuation of the eastern front of the porcupine ramparts fifty miles away to the northward a range of low mountains was discerned trending to the eastward and forming the northern boundary of the plain as i afterward discovered they formed the true watershed of northeastern alaska and the country beyond to the mackenzie river it took three days to cross this plain on the first day a tribe of nigalek eskimos were encountered they were fine-looking savages and seemed much surprised to meet white men so far away from the trading posts they broke camp on the following day and started northward for the summer hunt on the arctic we crossed innumerable lakes during the next few days and on the fifth day crossed the mountains at an altitude of three thousand feet the descent on the northern slope was abrupt my burly foreman covered the distance rapidly by sliding down head foremost necessitating various repairs to certain portions of his trousers we found the temperature much lower on the northern side of the mountains ranging from minus twenty degrees to minus fifty degrees fahrenheit i slept in a parka and beneath a deerskin robe in the morning the long hair around the front of the hood was one mass of ice which had to be thawed out before the parka became manageable after descending the mountains the route led through a valley hemmed in by most forbidding looking mountains running up in jagged spurs to a height of six thousand or eight thousand feet three rivers in this valley run into one which has its outlet near the eastern extremity of the basin a large area was covered with ice the result of overflow but at the outlet the current had worn its way through the ice and the vapor arising from the exposed surface gave the appearance at a distance of a boiling spring this river was followed to the shores of the arctic ocean passing often between towering mountains or through gloomy canyons where the wind howled dismally on the eighteenth day april eighth the ocean was reached a stiff breeze was blowing from the southeast and the mercury registered minus thirty degrees a fire of driftwood was made and shelter was secured under the lee of a snowbank the drifting snow shrouded the horizon until late in the afternoon when the wind ceased and a long line of hummocky ice was revealed skirting the gloomy shore a record of our visit was enclosed in a brass shell some observations were made and early the next day the return trip was begun camp colonna was reached in six days a rapid journey considering the nature of the country the frigid temperature and the depth of the snow although the season was already well advanced and the sun well on its northern journey not the slightest evidence of a thaw could be detected north of the valley of the three rivers the stream which was followed to the ocean was frozen to the bottom objects ten feet beneath the ice being plainly visible through the transparent medium end of section twenty five Section 26 of National Geographic Magazine, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schempf. Collinson's Arctic Journey by General A. W. Greeley. Somewhat more than a year ago, the members and guests of the National Geographic Society had the great pleasure of hearing from the lips of Lieutenant Commander Charles H. Stockton, U.S. Navy, a detailed and interesting account of his remarkable voyage in the U.S.S. Thetis during the summer and autumn of 1889, from San Francisco through Bering Strait, around Point Barrow, eastward to the mouth of Mackenzie River and thence westward to Harold and Wrangell Islands, whence he returned to his home port. It was a remarkable voyage, and Commander Stockton deserves a special credit for the professional ability and personal energy displayed by him throughout so trying and so successful a trip. This account, somewhat enlarged, has been written up by another hand than Stockton's, and published for a very large audience, the readers of Scribner's magazine, April 1891. The value of all journeys to remote regions depends primarily on the fidelity and accuracy with which the account of such voyages may be written. No one who knows Commander Stockton, or who has heard his personal account, doubts that he has rather understated than exaggerated the circumstances of his voyage. It is, therefore, with a feeling of very great disappointment that every well-informed reader must have perused the opening paragraphs which are incorrect in statement and most unjust by inference to the gallant predecessors of commander stockton the article entitled where the ice never melts begins as follows two score years ago it was in august eighteen fifty a vessel lay at anchor far to the north beyond the arctic circle to the south of her rose a lofty cone-shaped island to the north to the east and to the west beyond the narrow lane of open water wherein she lay stretched for untold miles the blue ice that hard as granite yields nothing to the blaze of the sun above her was the gray arctic sky colder even to behold than the blue ice itself all around was the silence of the far north the terrible arctic silence that drives men mad with a longing for some sound only the coming and going of the vessel's crew gave life to the scene the vessel was Her Britannic Majesty's ship investigator, Captain McClure. The place was the mouth of the great river Mackenzie. The island was that named in honor of the famous astronomer, Sir William Herschel. For nearly two score years, no vessel crossed the waters of Mackenzie Bay. Herschel Island, unvisited for more than a generation, was but a name on the maps. At last, one summer drove back the ice farther than before in forty years and the west wind helped it, and then, through the narrow lanes of water and through the shifting ice, came nine vessels, eight of them dinghy craft, whaling vessels, but the other a trim ship, whose sails were white, whose metal work shone, from whose peak fluttered the stars and stripes, the United States steamer Thetis, commanded by Lieutenant Commander Stockton, the first man-of-war that ever reached Herschel Island, the first vessel ever to fly in that lonely place, the flag of the United States. The Arctic voyage made by the late captain, afterwards Admiral Sir Richard Collinson, in His Majesty's ship Enterprise, from 1851 to 1854, was perhaps, everything considered, the most successful expedition made in Arctic research prior to the use of steam. Collinson passed Point Barrow in 1851, and wintered for that season in Walker Bay, 71 degrees, 35 minutes north, 170 degrees, 39 minutes west, on Prince Albert Land, to the east of Banks or Bering's Land. The next season, 1852-53, he wintered in Cambridge Bay, 69 degrees, 3 minutes north, 105 degrees, 12 minutes west. He left Cambridge Bay in the summer of 1853 on August 10th, and on September 15th reached Camden Bay, near Flaxman Island between the Mackenzie and Point Barrow. The sea was nearly open, but strong easterly winds packing the ice to the west of the bay formed a sufficient barrier to prevent Collinson escaping from the ice, especially as he was depending entirely on sail. The Enterprise here wintered in 70 degrees 8 minutes north, 
one hundred and forty five degrees twenty nine minutes west and in the ensuing summer on july twentieth eighteen fifty four was able to sail eastward to bering strait as already said collinson's voyage was remarkably successful herschel island which was reached by stockton and the american whalers under steam is about fifteen degrees in longitude east of point barrow but collinson took his vessel under sail about forty degrees east of that point or nearly three times as far beyond point barrow perry in his wonderful voyage to winter harbor traversed only thirty degrees of longitude from the open water of lancaster sound but collinson took his vessel nearly twice as far from the free waters of bering strait it should be noted to collinson's credit that the series of straits through which he tacked his vessel were the worst that had ever been successfully navigated to a considerable distance by any arctic expedition and that in addition to his journey from bering strait to cambridge bay and return he also carried the enterprise up mcclure strait to as high a point as was reached by the investigator in short no other vessel came so near completing the northwest passage as the enterprise the writer of the article referred to was not ignorant of collinson's journey for on page four hundred and eighty he refers to the fact that collinson wintered at camden bay in eighteen fifty three four on the other hand mcclure never visited herschel island it is not mentioned in any of his reports and the track charts both in armstrong's northwest passage and in osborne's account of mcclure's voyage show that the investigator under mcclure left the american coast near camden bay and steered northeastward into the polar pack into which the investigator penetrated nearly ninety miles from land obliged by the closing ice to turn backward mcclure made pelly island on the eastern side of mackenzie river thus making a long detour in which his nearest approach to herschel island was at a point about twenty-five miles northeast of it the records thus show that mcclure found an open sea from point barrow eastward in eighteen fifty collinson in eighteen fifty one and eighteen fifty three and stockton in eighteen eighty nine while the american whalers came safely back in eighteen ninety in short it may be said that nearly every year the mackenzie may be reached by steam whalers and that the ice is neither eternal nor fixed along the shores of northern alaska and the mackenzie river region it appears to be a proper labor of the national geographic society to favor the correction of errors relating to the noted journeys and ill-known regions hence this attempt to do justice to collinson and to correct the inferential error as to the mackenzie river which by a flight of fancy only can be described as a land where the ice never melts end of section twenty six section twenty seven of the national geographic magazine volume four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org notes topographic survey of canada some two years ago a book on the subject of photographic surveying by mr e deville surveyor general of canada was issued by the dominion land office apparently this is a book of instructions and treats exhaustively of the methods of photographing and of using photographs for constructing maps therefrom since few are acquainted with this subject it may be well to characterize briefly the method of surveying by photography a few points including all occupied stations are located by angular measurements from the occupied points photographs of the surrounding topography are taken a complete round of the horizon usually being made from each station devices are employed for facilitating the measurement of horizontal and vertical angles from the photographs and the photographs are sent to the central office at ottawa where maps are constructed from them angles are measured from the photographs and thus all points for location are fixed their heights determined and contour lines located 
To topographers on the southern side of the boundary, this appears to be a very indirect way of making a map. Most of those who have studied the subject are aware that this method has been experimented with by several countries and discarded by all except Italy and Canada. The topographers of all other countries are accustomed to making maps directly in the field, using the country itself as copy and not passing it through the medium of a photograph. By this simple and direct method, it is believed that a more lifelike transcript of the original can be obtained, and, moreover, that the work can thus be done more rapidly and at less expense. A few sheets recently issued by the Dominion Land Office appear to sustain this position. They are lithographed on a scale of 1 to 40,000, relief being expressed by contours at intervals of 100 feet and by shading. They represent a portion of the Rocky Mountain region on the line of the Canadian Pacific Railway. In many respects, these maps are very creditable productions. A commendable attempt has been made to map a wild and unknown region, and the use of hill shading, combined with contours, is a move toward giving a graphic presentation of the appearance of the country. The shading is not altogether satisfactory, owing perhaps to lack of practice on the part of the draftsman, as this is something which requires years of study to produce with good effect. The maps are printed in five colors, though probably one of these, red, used to represent trails and roads, might well have been replaced by black. The brown for the contours, green to represent forests, and blue for drainage, with black for culture, gives one of the most satisfactory and effective combinations possible. There are, however, some serious defects in these maps. The representation of the topographic features is hardly natural. There is a want of detail and little suggestion of the ruggedness of the country. An experienced topographer immediately notes many features which are plainly due to misinterpretation of the photographs. From the appearance of the country as mapped, one would expect to be able to take a pack train anywhere, whereas in reality, the ruggedness of the country forbids travel even on foot in the greater portion of this region. These are results of the extreme generalization due to the making of maps from photographs. The scale employed might well be reduced, say, to two miles to an inch. This scale would be amply large to show every detail represented, and would be more in consonance with the vertical scale of 100-foot contour intervals which is employed. Apparently but a small number of stations were occupied in mapping the country. On one of these sheets in particular, the anthracite sheet, but one station appears to have been occupied in a total area of 65 square miles. The expense of this work, $8 per square mile, is double that of work on a scale of two miles to the inch on this side of the boundary, with which it may be compared. H. M. W. End of section 27section 28 of the national geographic magazine volume 4 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org notes lieutenant peary's crossing of northern greenland the following account of this remarkable journey is condensed from the only official sources available, which are the accounts over Lieutenant Peary's signature in the New York Sun of October 25 and 31, 1892. Lieutenant Peary's party of seven wintered at Red Cliff, on the shore of McCormick Bay, in about 77 degrees 7 arc minutes north, 71 degrees west. On April 30, 1892, the advance traveling party left Redcliffe, followed May 2 by Lieutenant Peary. 
Besides the leader, the expedition consisted of Dr. Cook, Gibson, Astrup, Matt, and seven Eskimo, with three sledges and twenty dogs. Within a few miles, the summit of the inland ice was reached at a spot 2,500 feet above sea level, where a cache camp was established near Ananatak, the Eskimo name for a rocky peak rising above the level of the surrounding inland ice. From this point, Matt was sent back, owing to a frozen hill. A second igloo, snow house, was built on May 8th, but afterward, snow houses were dispensed with as demanding too much time to construct. By May 14, after extremely fatiguing work and double banking, the true inland ice may be said to have been reached. By this time, 16 out of 20 dogs remained, and the disabled sledges were reduced from 8 to 4, all of one type. The party were individually equipped with a deerskin kulita, and sleeping bag, a sealskin timiak, and seal kamiks or moccasins. The party crossed the divide of the inland ice between Whale Sound and Cane Basin at an elevation of 5,000 feet, and thence descended toward the basin of Humboldt Glacier. The course of travel was toward the northeast, and camp separation was made 130 miles from McCormick Bay. At this point it was decided that Lieutenant Peary should go forward with Astrup, while Dr. Cook and Gibson, with a light sledge and two dogs, and rations for twelve days, should return to McCormick Bay. On May 31, Lieutenant Peary reached the divide of inland ice and looked down on the basin of Peterman Fjord. He was obliged, owing to crevasses, to deflect ten miles to the eastward, where he made Camp Peterman, at which he remained thirty-six hours to determine his position and take bearings. From this point, gigantic crevasses obliged him to travel due eastward for ten miles, when he took a course northeastward, hoping to clear the basin of Sherard Osborne Fjord. Crossing another divide of the inland ice, June 8 found Lieutenant Peary and his party descending into St. George Fjord, which penetrates far inland. Here they were detained two days by a severe storm, after which the character of the glacier ice to the northward was so unfavorable that they were obliged to turn southward and eastward, and after two days of hard work found that they had lost fifteen miles of their northing, besides injuring their team. The point reached on the inland ice was now 6,000 feet above the level of the sea. A northeasterly course was again followed, but unfavorable ice and enormous crevasses obliged frequent detours eastward. On June 26, still at an elevation of 6,000 feet, the course was northeastward, but land appearing in that course, a detour eastward was again necessary which led to a comparatively flat, round-topped, ice-clad land. Skirting the edge of the inland ice parallel with the land, they reached their highest northing on the 82nd parallel. Here there was land to the northwest, northward and northeast. Of its character, Lieutenant Peary says, Dark brown and red cliffs looked down into a grand, vertical-walled canyon reaching up toward our camp and everywhere to the northwest, north and east, black and dark red precipices, deep valleys, mountains capped with cloud-shadowed domes of ice, stretched away in a wild panorama. From this point, Lieutenant Peary was obliged to travel toward the southeast parallel, with the edge of the inland ice and the shoreland. On July 1, a wide opening between high vertical cliffs allowed Lieutenant Peary to travel northeastward and quit the summit of the inland ice, then 5,000 feet above sea level. Following down a steep gradient toward the red-brown land, rivers and lakes became visible along the margin of the ice, and the party finally reached the highest point of a moraine after wading many streams and floundering through much melting snow. 
Leaving Astrup and his team at this point, Lieutenant Peary started northeastward to climb a cliff which apparently commanded a view of the coast and seemed to be only five miles away. The mountain appeared to recede as he advanced, and after eight hours' work to reach the summit, it proved that intervening hills shut out a full view of the coast. By this time, Lieutenant Peary's footgear was practically worn out and his feet injured from the broken sharp rocks, and it was only by improvising footgear from his sealskin mittens and cap that he was able to return to camp. On July 3 with Astrup, he descended to the shore and kept along the crest of rock-strewn mountains. Finally, on July 4, they reached the summit of a rocky plateau with a sheer face rising 4,000 feet above the bay, which was named Independence Bay from the day of its discovery. On the east was a great ice stream named Academy Glacier, beyond which rose a yet higher vertical cliff, on a portion of which rested a great projecting tongue of inland ice. Of the view, Lieutenant Peary says, Some fifteen miles northeast from where we stood, these cliffs ended in a bold cape, just beyond the fan-shaped face of the great glacier, and the shore from there swept away to the eastward. West of us lay the opening of the fjord which had barred our northern advance. Northwest stretched steep red-brown bluffs with a flat foreshore reaching to the water's edge. The resemblance of these bluffs to the eastern shore of McCormick Bay was very striking. Close at hand, a single isolated ice cap crested these bluffs, but disappeared in the middle distance, and beyond that, the shores which stretched far away to the northeast were free of snow and the summits free of ice caps. The bay itself beyond the glacier face seemed perfectly smooth, and far out in its center a clouded appearance showed the beginning of the process of disintegration in the formation of water pools upon the surface. Between the bold cape on the right and the distant northern shore, the white level of the sea ice stretched out to meet the distant horizon over the mysterious eastern Arctic Ocean. Observations for position were made, those for longitude being based on equal altitudes, with the resulting latitude of 81 degrees 37 arc minutes 4 arc seconds north, and a longitude from map of about 34 degrees west. A cairn was raised in which were placed a record of the journey, a thermometer, and copies of the New York Sun and Harper's Weekly. The national flags belonging to the Philadelphia Academy of Natural Sciences and the National Geographic Society the latter flag presented by Miss Dahlgren, were displayed. The Arctic poppy and other flowers, purple and white, were present, together with the snow bunting. Musk ox trails were frequent, and five musk oxen were killed. The return to McCormick Bay was made in nearly a straight line, and the main divide of the inland ice was crossed at an elevation of 8,000 feet. The main incidents of the return journey were an experience of the most violent storm and the loss of several dogs, whereby the number was reduced to five. The return journey occupied 31 days. The journey of Lieutenant Peary is most extraordinary. Its most important geographic result is the determination of a great fjord opening eastward into the Greenland Sea at a point some 200 miles north of the highest position reached on the eastern coast of Greenland by any of Lieutenant Peary's predecessors. Perhaps not less important is the confirmation of the opinion expressed eight years ago by General Greeley that Greenland ends near the 82nd parallel and that the land to the northward is probably separate. Lieutenant Peary's most northerly point in latitude 82 degrees was that looking down on the great fjord which debouches in Independence Bay. It is of course not proved, but it is almost beyond question, that this is a continuation of Nordenskjold Inlet, which begins in the polar ocean near the 83rd parallel. Of this fjord, discovered by Lieutenant Lockwood, 
May 6, 1882, that lamented and distinguished officer says, The fjord at whose mouth we camped ran to the southeast or south to an immense distance. No land visible at its head. Lockwood was a very conservative man, and he charted this fjord southeastward to only longitude 45, which is but five degrees eastward or less than 50 miles northwest of the most northerly point reached by Lieutenant Peary. The character of the land seen by Peary to the north and northwest indicates satisfactorily that these two fjords are one, as charted by Lieutenant Peary in the New York Sun of October 31. The discovery of musk oxen at Independence Bay confirms General Greeley's supposition put forth in 1884 that these animals reach the eastern coast of Greenland through Norden's Kjold or some adjacent inlet. In his sketch map, New York Sun, October 31, Peary extends the northern coast of Independence Bay some 50 miles eastward to about 25 degrees west longitude. This easterly extension of bold, high, ice-free land with intervening water, where on the ice was in the process of disintegration, makes it exceedingly doubtful if a very high northing can be made on that coast, with McCormick Bay as a base. With Thank God Harbor as a home station, however, there will be no serious difficulty in making a very high latitude, say 85 degrees north, either via Lockwood's route or across the inland ice to Independence Bay. A W G End of section twenty eight Section twenty nine of the National Geographic Magazine Volume four This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Notes. Geographic Prizes. The National Geographic Society, with a view of encouraging geography in the public high schools of the United States, has instituted certificates and medals which are to be awarded annually in each state to such graduating pupils of public high schools as shall write the best original geographic essays on subjects to be selected by a committee of the Society. It is intended that each essay shall pertain to the continent of North America, and that it shall be comprehensive in its scope and limited in its length, so as to afford opportunity for originality of treatment. The cooperation of state superintendents of education will be sought by the society. The best essayist of each state will receive a certificate of efficiency from the National Geographic Society. The Geographic Gold Medal of the National Geographic Society will be awarded to the best essayist of the entire country, while the second best essayist will receive a certificate of honorable mention. The subject of the essay for 1893 will be announced shortly. General Rules 1. Essays will be received only from such public high schools as formally announce their intention to compete by May 31 of each year. 2. All essays must be entirely composed by the pupil, who must certify on honor that he has not received aid from any person. 3. No essay shall exceed 2,500 words in length. 4. In each state, the superintendent of public schools, if his cooperation can be secured, will select by such process as he deems advisable the three best essays, which shall be passed on by a committee of the National Geographic Society in order to select the best essay for each state and for the United States. 5. The certificate issued to the best essayist of each state shall set forth in proper terms that blank, being one of blank essayists from blank public high school, in the state of blank, is awarded the certificate by the National Geographic Society 
for his proficiency in geographic science. 6. No certificate shall be awarded to any competitor unless, in the opinion of the judges, the essay offered possesses sufficient merit to justify such award. It is desired that the superintendent of public schools in each state shall select, by such method as he deems advisable, the three best essays, and from the collection of such essays, the Committee of the National Geographic Society will select the best essay for each state and for the United States. One of the most important aims of the National Geographic Society is to stimulate and make more practical the study of geography, particularly with reference to America. The Society, therefore, seeks the cooperation of all educational workers in making its labors more efficient and general. To this end, gifts for medals and scholarships are solicited and identification with the Society by active membership and personal effort are urged. The Society already comprises among its active workers a considerable number of geographic scientists who have given liberally of their time and efforts with a view of stimulating public interest in geographic education. The society is a working one, and in its efforts to exercise an educational influence over the whole of the United States feels justified in asking liberal support from high-spirited citizens. The society numbers among its members over 700 persons and has active representatives in every state and territory. General A. W. Greeley, United States Army, Professor T. C. Mendenhall, Superintendent of the United States Coast and Geodetic Survey, and Professor W. B. Powell, Superintendent of Public Schools of the District of Columbia, constitute the committee charged with the selection of the subject and award of the prizes for 1893. End of Section 29 End of the National Geographic Magazine, Volume 4